Cool. All right, so meeting 44, indirect recon. So uh, we've finally gotten past all of the introductory stuff in the certified ethical hacker content. And we are now moving into the meat of the CEH content, which is pretty much following the stages of, I guess we could say the kill chain. Um, but here we are, we're gonna be talking about reconnaissance. Um, this isn't port scanning. I know some of you guys have come here and port scan before. It's nothing like port scanning. This is all how to find information about a target in the public domain. Um, so I think we have uh, two new people here with us tonight. So if you're new, uh, go ahead and we'll just uh, have your name, your major, your year, and you know either why you're interested in us or you know why you're here. And we'll start with you, Nick. So I'm Nick McClory, I'm a freshman doing computer science, and I just kind of followed Bailey over here. Cool. <laughs> I wait till you. Right. Uh, my name's Ryan Young, I'm in IT, I'm in uh, third year, and I came here because AJ told me about this book, and I wanted to become a hacker. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 we'll get there, for sure. So, um... We have five committees here on how the organizations run. We have our content info committee, finance committee, public affairs, outreach, and recruitment committee. Uh, and I guess this time we'll go ahead and just have some of our committee heads who are here just talk about what they do, starting with Jai. Public affairs, social media, and it's just running on online, like reach out to people, stuff like that. And we're always looking for help in any of these. Yep. Uh, content information, we're putting together basically uh, What's new in cybersecurity this week? And we're trying to put together a couple of uh, tutorial, tutorial videos, just like you know, really help with uh, the education aspect here. Yeah, and for outreach too. Mm -hmm. uh, recruitment, we just sort of try to get the word out there that we're a club, and especially now that we're official, we want to tell people that we're from the And where's Alex? He was here. Alex was here. I'll talk about it. Oh, cool. Go um, for it. Okay. I'm Ryan O'Connor. I'm VP, but I came from the uh, outreach committee. So outreach handles like all the planning, I guess, for outreach inside of the campus. We consider it outreach. Um, so mostly that's getting, I don't know, cups and you know, coolers, whatever, getting things up in time before get her done. Um, and then we go out to high schools. And say hi to them, get to know them, tell them about ourselves, blah, blah, blah. Uh, we do that uh, because, I don't know, there's, there's a lot of visibility on the club from like various places, you know, go yeah. to see that kind of thing. And, uh, and it really helps. They, they like the outreach. It helps us get fun. Actually, I'm hearing from an, uh, another guy who's just texting me about wanting to come here, so just be a memento. Um, so yeah, so uh, as for attention that we're getting from other places, uh, we're getting like something along the lines of $2 million from the state of Ohio to build the first cyber range for the state. Uh, we're also waiting on the immediate future, roughly $200,000 worth of equipment coming from Rapids, and that's going to be set up in our lab. Uh, 516 ERC, but because UC moves slow as molasses, when that happens, I don't know. I was told three weeks, three weeks ago. I was told three months, three months ago. So, you know, when it happens, that'll be awesome. But when we do get that equipment in, everybody in the chapter is going to be more than welcome to come get their hands on with this server equipment and learn how to actually set up a uh, cyber operations center or how to get your hands on setting up a network and how to defend it on the software side. So that's going to be really cool um, once we get that done. Uh, so that's kind of like our two bullet points down here. Where I also am uh, doing a little bit of work on a malware sandboxing lab. We have a server up on the 10th floor of Rhodes. Yes, it exists. Uh, and we have a bunch of VMs that we could spin up on it. It's basically got 32 terabytes of storage, uh, two Intel 8-core processors, and 64 gigs of RAM we have to play with. Uh, and that's what we're actually going to be running our CTF on for Revolution at UC. So if you guys are in, any interested at all in getting involved with any of our committees or helping out with these projects, just let me know. It's nothing like uh, once you commit, you've got to like, you know, stick with it. It's, it's a volunteer organization. Uh, so we will be running the CTF, Capture the Flag, if you don't know, at Revolution UC Hackathon this weekend. 
Uh, it's going to be based on Juice Shop, and we're going to be utilizing this other framework called CTFD for a scoreboard. It's going to be really cool, and I can uh, I can actually show you guys. Uh, let's do, 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 do. Can I just drag that over? Dope. Ten dot six three dot five dot. Uh, what is it? One eighty, right? Hey, hey, is it one eighty? One eighty for Juice Shop. Uh, just go to two hundred colon three thousand. 200 colon 3000 yeah. all right yeah so this is kind of like the CTF that we're gonna be running so you have all of these uh, it just looks like a normal web page but there is all of these different things you can do so like uh, find the carefully hidden scoreboard page which is this guy uh, and you had to do that by uh, inspecting the page source and the elements of it uh, and then you find this extra little uh, subdomain but you know we can there's another one like access a confidential document so I'm not going to show you guys how to do these because this is the CTF for revolution at UC but if you're going and you want to have a little bit of fun uh, you can have your own instance of one of these and you can hack away and learn about these vulnerabilities there are 55 of those challenges by the way yeah there's, there's a lot of them probably want to move the window back over Boom. Okay, cool. And then, uh, yeah, we were going to do sports. We were going to have a sport team, but I guess that, that fell through, sadly. Uh, I would have liked to see more people step up and, uh, you know, get together for that team because I think we only needed, like, ten people who wanted to play dodgeball. But, you know, we got eight, uh, so we're not going to be doing intramurals this year. I would rather do it in, like, the fall or something uh, if we can. Uh, here's a big deal. Lakota East, we're going to uh, Monday, March 5th. I think that's next Monday. We're going to be going out to them and just talking about bash, uh, going over a little bit of what is a CTF and just kind of like teaching these high schoolers a little bit about cybersecurity. That's going to be awesome. It's going to look good on us too. And then uh, Hayden's been working really hard. Uh, OC3 is the website for Ohio's cybersecurity initiative. So this is straight up at the top level of the Ohio State government. Um, the governor of Ohio appointed a guy to lead all the cybersecurity, and this is basically his website, and they are having us do it, and more specifically, Hayden do it. So uh, that's really cool that we got that like, opportunity, and it's definitely going to get us more out there in the limelight. It stands for, by the way, Ohio Cyber Collaboration Committee. I can never remember it once I look. But. Ohio Cyber Collaboration Committee. That's the OC3. So these are civilian business types that are really, really senior, have lots of money, lots of clout, blah, blah, blah. Forming this committee. Pretty cool. So it's pretty cool that we're, we're making their website. So this is uh, another thing I brought up last week. Um, if you guys are undergraduates, I think this is a really, really, really cool opportunity. Um, it is to research. Uh, network security stuff from intrusion detection systems, wireless sensor network security, software reverse engineering, privacy preserving data mining. Like this is just the slew of anything that's kind of related to cybersecurity. Um, you get a stipend, so you're paid to do research, $5,000 stipend for 10 weeks, uh, housing provided, $1,200 food allowance, and travel funds. Um, and it's all through the National Science Foundation. Uh, if you are interested, uh, I have these emails right here. You should just send them an email. Uh, and the review of applications begin on March 7th. So if you're looking for something to do this summer and you want to get some really awesome research in the field or just get your foot in the door, figure out what's going on, I really just recommend you email these people. Say you heard about this through Cyber at UC, and then uh, that might help you uh, get your foot in the door. Uh, really cool. Uh, also, uh, ASME eFest. This is over at uh, Penn State University. It's just a big engineering competition. Uh, it's three days long. It's just a whole bunch of ITCS related stuff. I think it'd be fun to go. Um, and if you want to register for that, uh, please go ahead. Um, I think we should, there should be a link somewhere up here, or you could just Google ASME Engineering Fest and Penn State, and it'd probably come up. But uh, the first 50 registrants, which is probably all taken, get a free ticket. Otherwise, I think we have to pay. Anything new in public affairs, Jay? Uh, no. <clears throat> Whenever we get people to make the uh, content for our website, the videos, uh, we post as well. Cool. All right, so I'll hand it over and get into some cyber sexy stuff.
Uh, real quick before we start in on that, if anyone wants to participate in the outreach, uh, feel free to speak to me or one of the other executives and we can uh, make sure we keep you in on that. Yeah, no, we definitely need help for outreach. Um, if anybody wants to, you know, skip some classes and go talk about security, feel free. Did you have a question, John? Yeah, what section is in charge of the Twitter account? What, that's public affairs. Public affairs. Yeah, that's weird. Okay. Uh, so, turns out, it was Russia all along. Uh, I don't know if anyone remembers my story from, uh, I think it was last week. I talked about a malware that they were calling Olympic Destroyer that got used during the opening ceremony at the Olympics. It was wiper malware, tried to go through, wipe out the content in all of the, uh, the Olympic Committee's computers. Made it, it took like 12 hours before anyone was actually able to print their ticket and get into the Olympics. So, pretty terrible. Turns out that was Russia. Uh, trying to get a little bit of payback because I don't know if anyone knows, but they got punished this year because during the last Winter Olympics, they got caught uh, helping their athletes with doping. And so none of the athletes from Russia were actually permitted to wear the Russian flag this year around. And if they won any medals, their country's anthem was not played. Well, apparently Russia wasn't a big fan of that punishment and decided to try and stick one to the Olympic Committee with this malware. Didn't work out, they got caught even though they were trying to frame North Korea the whole time. Uh, the only thing that surprises me about that is the fact that North Korea didn't also try and send a malware and it just got lost a few hundred miles off their border. Right. Um, <laughs> so, that, uh, what they did is called false flag operation. Uh, that's when you are trying to pretend to be from another country. So, like, uh, just to give like a physical example, if a U.S. soldier is in another con another country like Iraq or whatever, and he wants to make it seem like he's actually, I don't know, from Italy or something, so that the U.S. doesn't get blamed if he gets caught. He might wear an Italian uniform, whatever. Well, similar steps can be taken with malware. I'm not like super duper familiar with exactly what those steps are. You can use proxies for routing. You can try and write your software in another language and make it so that like it's easily decompiled into that language whatever um, so russia was actually able to hack hundreds of computers that the olympics was using uh, over 300 of them actually which is a lot and they also were able to deploy malware onto their routers that were being used for their networks which is apparently incredibly expensive to develop and i can definitely believe that uh, which which is a way of seeing that this was a really important goal for Russia that they were willing to drop so much funding into making this ha this attack happen. So they are, they are they were really not happy about uh, the 2014 Olympics uh, punishment. We also saw that a uh, Russian APT Fancy Bear, which is tied into the GRU, it's the uh, the Russians like. It's like they're kind of like their version of the NSA, sort of. It's a, it's a big intelligence collecting arm of their military. And so this group, Fancy Bear, it's a well-known Russian APT. They were involved with NotPetya. Um, they actually released a set of emails that were that seemed to be have been stolen from Olympic officials' emails. So if, if anyone was in doubt that it was the Russians, that's just <laughs> further proof. If I might add something too, uh, do you guys know what APT is? Yeah, APT is Advanced Persistent Threat. Um, that's how we talk about nation state or supposedly nation state hacker groups. They're highly funded, highly skilled uh, hackers, for lack of a better word. And Fancy Bear uh, also, I think, is known as some like I think it's like APT five or something. Um, there's different naming conventions for these hacker groups. Fancy Bear was coined by CrowdStrike, uh, which is a cybersecurity startup, and that's how they want to just refer to these hacker groups. So um, at least at Siemens uh, and a lot of other places, I know that they will refer to things underneath the CrowdStrike uh, naming conventions, where fancy is an adjective to describe that group, or it's adjective, and then the animal is where that group's from. So if you say like um, 
you know, conniving bear, that would be a, some Russian advanced persistent threat because bear is associated with Russia. You know, Chalima is associated with North Korea, which is like a mythical waking horse. Mm -hmm. This is kind of a funny naming convention, but I mean, people actually use it. Um, and I guess when you're trying to figure out who has done operations, you need to look at indicators of compromise. And I'm assuming that they maybe have saw a lot of IPs associating with Russia or domains associated with Russia um, that this hack was communicating out to. So I guess kind of a little background. So uh, these are a lot of different sources here. Uh, feel free to check those out. Uh, most of the information, though, can be found in that first link from Washington Post. Um, this is another one, while, we, while we're kind of talking about Russia a little bit, uh, this was something that got released during uh, a testimony by Michael Rogers, the director of the NSA. He was testifying in front of the Senate, and he, he kind of put some of this information out there, so I just thought, I thought it was relevant to the last article. So uh, Apparently, as, even as the director of the NSA, he doesn't actually have the day-to-day -day authority to try and take measures to prevent Russia from influencing our elections here in the U.S. And that is a, an authorization that will have to come down from the president himself, which has not happened at this point in time. I thought that was kind of interesting because, you know, Russia is able to take these cyber, cyber offensive, even if it's not always technically illegal, some of the actions they take, they are attempting to uh, perform malicious actions in the U.S., stir strife, you know, that sort of thing. And the NSA doesn't actually have authorization to make moves to prevent that on their own, not on such a, a, day, at a wide scale level. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, and he believes that the reason why Russia continues to this day to try and influence our elections is because we haven't actually taken measures to make them pay the price for it. Uh, we haven't mounted any sort of counteroffensive. We haven't taken a lot of steps to, tr to make it harder for them to do any of this. Um, we're, we're continuing to deny that it even happened. That's official. That's official. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I, I also think it's kind of difficult to say because, I mean, CrowdStrike released. CrowdStrike was the firm mm -hmm. that did the research into the, the DNC servers. Yeah. And uh, through reading their reports, I mean, a lot of people like to point the fingers at Russia, but past what I've seen, all I've seen is IPs. And if you know anything about indicators of compromise and fidelity, IP is not enough alone to try to tie. Yeah, but yeah, but the uh, the DNC hack is not attack. is not the whole thing that they're on the hook for. What they're really on the hook for is Twitter, Facebook, what they did there to be able to generate bots, to be able to put the message uh, out, you know, to further their message in certain key areas, which is, which is, they actually... Yeah, and, and that's the time. thing that the NSA really can't fight without approval from the White House, is these attempts for outside uh, government uh, agents to take these sort of actions that are not technically illegal in order to try and inf bring influence into the U.S. I, I think a good point to make on this from an analyst perspective is to just critically think until you see all of the data like presented, you know? So I, I, I think that we can hear about people talking about this, but I don't think any of us truly know exactly what's going on. Well, I mean, there are certain things that we know happened. For example, we know that there were Russian uh, citizens uh, who we believe were agents of their government who were doing things uh, like setting up these Twitter bots, uh, making these Facebook ads, which, while would not be illegal if they were a U.S. citizen, just because they did not file themselves as foreign actors, technically, they got them on that, but if they had filed themselves correctly on their on all their paperwork would not have been illegal and we don't actually take steps to prevent any sort of actions like that yeah we haven't done anything so very even though we know web. yeah yeah so there, there, it's not it's not only happened. malware attacks that we're referring to in this instance mm -hmm. so yeah so i did a paper uh last semester about uh facebook's algorithm mm -hmm. with machine learning 
and like the, even the former Facebook uh, chief security officer said like they had a big Russian meddling uh, like influence between because like what Facebook algorithm would do was well, kind of group you into certain ideology ideological groups. So uh, the bots would take advantage of that like, uh, and kind of influence the people of those groups using Facebook's algorithm problem. Uh, but like that was a huge issue. Like Facebook mm -hmm. even came forward and said like we did not like, expect that to like be an issue. Yeah, and and we've seen fur yeah, exactly. we've seen further influence from Russia on on uh, both sides of uh, the gun control issue recently from uh, doing doing the exact same thing with the bots and the advertisements mm -hmm. yeah. happening well, for both pro to... and anti gun control just to try and stir up trouble here in the U S. Try and inflame both sides. They did that in Texas, right? I, I mean, I think I think we're getting into politics. Yeah, yeah, we're we're we we're kind of sliding a little bit into politics. Sure. Mostly, this was. Uh, just, uh, yeah, I thought it was interesting that the NSA actually, even as the director of the NSA, he has no yeah. power to try and uh, fight this sort of outside influence from uh, another government. Yeah. Uh, now getting back to something a little bit more uh, cyber-technical, uh, a company called New Tech Business Services Corp. Or Corp. Uh, they actually just lost three of their domains recently. And it caused some serious problems. Um, so the, these guys are, are not like super duper massive, but they do uh, manage over a hundred thousand businesses' websites for them. Um, and one of their core domains that was stolen uh, was actually replaced by a chat service, so that when people who wanted to manage their websites came to this link, they were actually speaking on a direct chat with the uh the attacker and he you know so as we've all seen at time and time again whenever people think they're talking to a trusted source but it's actually the bad guy you know hey can, i'm gonna need your website domain and i'm gonna need your user information or whatever you know and all kinds of critical information can be leaked uh, the real problem that arises with this is uh kind of how new tech was handling the situation so they sent out on Saturday afternoon a, an email to their clients saying that they had changed their domains due to increased security, but there was actually no mention of the fact that there was an attack ongoing, that their domains had been stolen, and that was why they needed to be changed. Uh, there was no warning put out to their clients that if they'd used the domain that, they had been, that they, their information had been stolen. Um, and the, uh, the attacker in this case, uh, we're like 99% sure he's a, uh, a Vietnamese uh, origin um, because his chat center is still live and he is willing to speak to you if you talk to him apparently. So, because uh, that's what the source for this article, I believe it was Krebs, I'd have to check again real quick, actually went. He's the and the, chat service for anybody wants to talk to him. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. Wait, what's the URL? <laughs> uh, I believe it is on my next slide. We'll, we'll get to it in just a second. But um, So 10 hours after the incident, New Tech finally acknowledges that the, the problem, uh, the reason why they had to change their domains was because of a dispute not, not that they had been stolen, they said it was a dispute over the over three different domains, and they told their uh, customers that they should not go to those domains anymore. They didn't say, if you've used your information in those domains, you've been compromised. They didn't say, we recommend you change your passwords. They didn't put any sort of, sort of warning out on their, on their homepage, on their website. And that's really where a lot of their clients are getting angry. Um, and so apparently the reason why the attacker decided to do this is he notified them five days prior, which if anyone uh, isn't aware, the standard practice is 90 days. If you find a zero day vulnerability, you wait 90 days before you release something to the public. Uh, this is a little bit different because he didn't just release his attack to the public, he actually carried it out on New Tech, but he found a bug in their online operations and he told them about it and they just ignored him. So I guess he decided to prove it was a big problem. Uh, and as I mentioned, the various issues with how New Tech has decided to handle the situation, um, their customers are not happy. They're in a, a lot of trouble just because no one really told them just how severe the situation was and they only had to find out on their own. Uh, 
hours or days later. Um, so if you follow that link, they do have the website of the uh, stolen domains in there. But uh, the reason why we are so confident that this attacker is Vietnamese is when they communicated with him. Uh, he, re he responded in Vietnamese. Uh, he said he gave an email and he said that he would respond to it only if his questions only if the questions were asked in Vietnamese. Um, we we tracked a, we we tracked that email being used through a tool called Domain Tools to several domains which are using IP addresses in Vietnam. So I think it's pretty safe to say he's Vietnamese. This, this all kind of tries into what we're going to talk cafe, about. Cafe, maybe he's, maybe yeah, maybe. Think that he's in Vietnam. Yeah, maybe he's actually uh, he's South like, Korean or something. Who knows? He's probably in some cafe, you know, where he. Pay, you know, you only have to pay like five cents for a freaking hour mm -hmm. for your use because you know they have a bunch of those out in Asia. I, I think uh, where people play games and make money and convert it mm -hmm. into money to pay for their usage, and then they make money, and that's their job. Game, game cafes. Yeah. Yeah. Cafes. yeah. But uh, no, I think I think a big I think a big thing we should focus on from the story is the rise of supply chain attacks. It just keeps happening. It's going to keep happening. Uh, and this is just, you know, just another perfect example. People are attacking the businesses that you do business with to get to you. It's a lot easier to get to a business's customers than it is to hack all their customers. So now, recons. Can I throw something in here? A comment right yeah, go, go for it. Uh, so most of the people, if people get into this field, within 20 years or so, you guys are all going to be kind of important people in, in your perspective. Okay? Do you expect that? I, I can say for sure that it is the cybersecurity leadership, it's their job to convince the executives to not do stupid shit like the, that, the stuff that that company did. It's your job to, to, to talk them into you know, how to handle it well, because it started with the penetration, you know, and their own cybersecurity people were the very first people to start the conversation about. And, 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 that's, and that's why we're reaching out to the high schools and why we have our meetings and, you know, yeah. Why we try to get that information out there. So let's get to the cyber sexiest stuff, which is the indirect recons. All right. Uh, quick reminder, everyone, the hackathon is this weekend. Uh, lots of clubs are doing cool stuff, and I know we're doing Capture the Flag. All right, our topics today go something exactly like this. We're going to go through the steps of ethical hacking again, because we're getting to the real stuff now. Um, we're going over information gathering today. So we're going to talk about what is it and what types of it exist, and then why do we, why do, we do it and ways to do it. And then we have a couple of tools, pretty simple today. Um, we're doing indirect information gathering or passive information gathering. So all the tools we'll be, we'll be using are public records. Just about. I forgot to tell the about that. All right. We're not going to use it immediately, but if you want your Kali Linux to work, you should probably start it now. So in the steps of ethical hacking, the first thing we do is gather information on the target. This gives us knowledge about what they have, what they can stop us with, and how we can get around it. Yep. So this is the first real step in the ethical hacking process that we have covered. So why is this useful, and what is it? We are just gathering useful information, and yeah. That can include anything from knowing that someone is out of town to knowing exactly what version of a payroll software they use. A lot of it also is jargon used by uh, said companies. Yeah. If you know how to talk the talk, it's used a lot in social engineering. Yeah. So types of information gathering, there's indirect, that's using anything publicly facing. So if they have an entry on LinkedIn, if they have a LinkedIn page, that would be considered indirect uh, information gathering if you went to the LinkedIn. If direct information gathering is directly talking to the target, so if you send them a phishing email or if you apply for a job there with the intent of getting more inside information, that is direct. So types of information that exist, network and systems information. Um, if they're running Windows 8 or Windows 10, that's the system information. What tools are they using? Are they developing software? Are they using Visual Studio? And then what's running on the network? Do they have any firewalls or IPSs that could get in place? That's mostly direct information gathering for that section. Um, organizational is more of the passive stuff. So 
what does their business do as a whole? What, what kind of employees are they hiring? Are they hiring people who can speak Dutch? Are they going to then use those Dutch employees to expand their Dutch operations, things like that? What are their business goals? Who's supplying them if they're selling things? So if they're running a poultry company, who's giving them chickens? Or who's selling them chickens? Yeah. And then just general client information. Who are they selling those chickens to after they get them? And then security. So what kind of systems they have in place? Is there any physical security? And is there any network security? That, that's, again, more direct. So our sources of information for indirect, we have public records. So if they're filing for building permits in the area, what is the content of those building permits? Are they, are they putting secure rooms in for classified materials? Um, job postings, again, if they're hiring a bunch of people for HR and who speak certain languages, they're probably going to expand into areas that have those languages highly spoken. So what are the skills of people they're hiring? Um, who connects with them on LinkedIn? So people who have recently connect, connected with a company on LinkedIn either work there already or have just started working there. And then news articles and their own website can actually review, reveal a lot of information about what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and then technical records, so things like DNS records. So where are their servers located? Who's running them? What's running on them? Yeah. And if they, if say Apple was going to buy a thousand DNS names, what would that say? It probably says they're about to release a new product that has something to do with those DNS names. So, yeah, goals of information gathering are to find potential gaps or loopholes that we can exploit later. Yeah, kind of repetitive on that one. You got to have the whole picture, the big picture, yeah. before you can ever really uh, penetrate the text. Can I say a couple things about this? Yeah. Okay. So you, you bring up an important thing, which is get the competitive advantage. So, you know, there's information gathering for the purposes of penetration, right? which is what we're mostly going to focus on. But reconnaissance is broader, and it can mean any type of intelligence. Okay. The question uh, I pose, how many people know the difference between reconnaissance versus surveillance? That's a good question. Now. Surveillance is persistent, right? Reconnaissance is what you do before you do surveillance, right? You'll do reconnaissance, and you might be sporadic with that. But once you get, once you perform surveillance, at that point it becomes like you're maintaining the surveillance for a period of time. But it's continuous reconnaissance, if you will. Interesting. Yeah. So competitive advantages would be: are people from other businesses that compete with you looking at your company <laughs> trying to get a leg up on that? So that can be a danger in the business world. It's a little less technical, but it's still a very real danger. Yeah, so threats of information gathering. The first other thing on there is the business intelligence and competitive analysis. Um, so our competitor knows what we are doing, and they're going to try to do it better. And then revealing our network architecture. So if a potential malicious actor knows that we use this type of VPN service, they will probably try to attack it to get into our network. All right, so tools for this, for indirect. Uh, Google likes search engines. so. I think Bing is technically on that list. So Google has a lot of search filters built into it by default, but not everyone uses these. I think the, the best one is file type PDF. You can basically look for, I know the top three are what site you're looking at, what protocol it's coming over, and then what type of information you're looking for, so PDFs. And then there's Shodan-like search engines, which you can use to find specific web services. You guys ever messed around with Shodan? Anyone know what Shodan is? Cool. Shodan's pretty cool. You go on that website and it's uh, it pretty much is like a, uh, I guess, giant database of open devices. So like if people just left default passwords on their uh, like webcam, you could go to it on Shodan and watch them through their webcam. It looks like this. It's pretty. It's pretty creepy. It's Here, pretty wait, crazy. Oh, on wait, wait, wait. Go, go to the top. Yeah. yeah. Go to the top right. UC's network blocks hacking stuff, but my proxy doesn't. Yeah, I don't know. All right. 
So, nice. I don't actually know how to use Shodan. Let's do FTP. So there's an FTP service spreading in Turkey. So I'll just show you a bunch of open yeah. ports, open uh, ports on IPs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so Shodan is yeah. fun to play around with. If you ever need a uh, private key for it, I recommend looking up keys to it. That's besides the point. Yeah. All right. So for Shodan, like search engines, you're not looking for content on the pages anymore. You're looking for what's behind the pages. So what kind of servers they're using, and then where their services are running on the network. And what they have besides just like web pages. Yeah. Do they have an FTP server open? That's... Or worse, a database server oh, or yeah. something. Do they have <laughs> or... Schemaverse? Or like a remote desktop server with no password. Yeah. This actually happens a lot with industrial devices. <laughs> you oh, yeah. can find like a, you can find like a, like mining equipment. Yeah, you can find like mining equipment and like control things for like big factories, and it's just like yeah, no password, or the password is still admin or password. <laughs> is a script somewhere that'll just scan the internet for open remote desktop, connect, take a screenshot, and come back? It's really interesting to watch what comes up on that. It's just everything you could ever imagine is on there. <laughs> Things that should not be connected to the internet are on there. Someone's fridge was on it. Fridge? Yeah. Fridge. Yeah. I'm not good. Right. And then I think I have, next, I have the next slide right over here. here. No. No. Okay. Our next tool is going to be social networks. So LinkedIn's a really good example of this. Everyone puts what they do on LinkedIn, and then they put where they do it at. So you can correlate. This is a little bit more technical might need to be automated to do it effectively. But you can correlate where they work, what their workplace is looking for, and then what they do. And you can infer a lot of information about that. And then sometimes you can actually find clients from a LinkedIn page. There then, are tools to do that. There are. And then we, as hackers, can read between the lines and figure out what's going on. So that's more the business intelligence side of things. Yeah. You have the next slide? Oh, no. I did. And then we have DNS records. So DNS is the phone book of the internet. We can find out what their, how many servers they have, where their servers are located, are they hosting it themselves or not. That can actually tell you a lot itself. Um, yeah. And if they register a bunch of new domains, that probably tells you something about their future plans. All right. And then public records. So. If they're filing a lot of building records for a pretty well developed, pretty new building, you can probably infer that they're putting something strange in there, like skiff rooms. If you don't know what a skiff room is, it's basically a vault that is a cubicle, and then you can have top secret material in it. Typically um, blocks signals surrounded by like a Faraday cage. Yeah. It has a white noise generator, so you can't hear what is talked about from inside. Yeah, they're pretty fun. They're pretty interesting. They're really dark and boring. <laughs> um, yeah, and they can show us future business plans. So if they're planning on expanding anywhere, they will have to file, if they're a large enough business, or if they're any business, they will have to file property turnover documents. Cool. Yeah. And then they can show us their, their current business issues. So like I said, that's not going to be, I guess I included like if they had their own website as public records. So if Kroger always, Kroger always has milk and eggs, and if they don't have milk and eggs, there's a supplier issue going on. All right, that's it. Oh, okay, so now we're gonna do it. So get your laptops up, get on Google, okay. wake up. We're gonna do it? Yeah, yeah, we're gonna do it. We're gonna yeah. do it. We're gonna do Google dorking. Oh so uh, this is what Google dorking is. And there's some really great uh, information out there too on how to do it and Google dorks that have already been done for you that show you interesting things on the internet. Uh, ExploitDB actually has a really great Google hacking database which where you can put in a search term and it will show you like, oh, all of these are vulnerable to this cross-site scripting attack, this, that, and the other. Um, so what we're going to do here is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to bring this thing over here. And let's just go ahead and we'll do an in title. So we'll in title. Uh, we'll, I'll just do it here, maybe. Chrome, like, what you're doing up there. Oh, well, screwed. Okay. In title. That's how you start your Google dork. You say, all right, I'm looking for what is in the HTML title. And I want to look in for like login pages. 
So login would be a keyword in the HTML title of a page is for logging in. By the way, if you're not, if you don't know what HTML title means, it's when you look at the tab, that's the HTML title, the text that appears up there. Hey, the, so here we go. Website. It's just it has returned to us a bunch of logins, login screens. You know, and this isn't hacked. This isn't totally <laughs> super useful. It's not like it's showing us login screens of pwned servers, but we can get login screens. So you, you can be more, uh, you know, um, specific in your searches. It's also good for finding PDF docs that you like. Um, ah, this is a really cool one to look up cameras, but we'll show you the in URL. So a lot of times when you go to a web page, and you know how the URL is this thing up here, right? Yeah? You can have your like login.php. So we can click on this again, and now we see, oh, here's the login.php for this company. So it's just another way to find logins. We can do something more fun, you know? You can look up uh, file types. And this is always good for looking up books. Although you shouldn't pirate books. Uh, you know, file type PDF. Okay, well, it doesn't, doesn't show us any. I think it's X. More specific. Uh, uh, let's just do, can we do like, maybe it's EXT. EXT, comma, PDF, and it should just show us a bunch of. No, it is file type. I think they just want you to be more specific than just asking it for every PDF on the internet. <laughs> I think file type was correct. I think you have to add that. You, gotta, you have to add it. Search it. Hmm? Yeah, you need to add a search for your file. It's not going to show you every PDF. You okay. Uh, chicken. Chicken. Chicken PDF. Oh, uh, yeah, so here we go. Here we go. Took me a second. Um, so there you go. Now you got PDFs. They're all PDFs about chicken. What? This one? Oh, this is a great paper. <laughs> I've seen this before. <laughs> what is this? It's all about chicken. Okay. Interesting. Um, there's also <laughs> indexes. Whoop! Hello. Why did, why did we? You use... shook the, the window. I makes, got it. Window <laughs> makes everything go away when you shake a window too much. So we'll go ahead and put that down here, and we'll do uh, in text, and then I think we can do like index of. See if we can find the index of a website. So those quotations match that exactly. And then we could just see. That's probably a Mozilla. Yeah, that's a Mozilla article. Yeah, so I mean, it pulls you into pages like that, which shows you the index of their web server. Yeah, look at that. That's a public key. Yeah. So, you know, it's just interesting that you can kind of do that, and now you have a bunch of web servers you can, you can poke around on. Um, it's public. And then we can do, you can even limit it to certain sites. So I'm not going to type that one in, but if you were wanting to do Google dorking on a specific domain, so you say, oh, I only want to find the index of something, anything related to Kroger.com. You know, you could do that. And then there's also modifiers. Plus will require your search term to match exactly. Net minus will avoid it. Star is a wild card. And then the quotations we used here will search for that specific phrase. So you could be like cats and then plus dogs. And I think we should probably get images of dogs before we get images of cats, you know. Um, so that's interesting. But it's some really basic stuff. But Google dorking is uh, definitely a very real and helpful thing. So now what we're going to do is we're going to do Google dorking for webcams. See what this is. I don't like the link. I like the link. And title, we'll do. You got save search on, right? You might want to turn your proxy off. Or, wait, they don't block. Never mind. We have proxy on. So this is. It's, in URL. it's literally connecting to my server at my house. Uh, in so in URL access. <laughs> Ha <laughs> 
I don't know what this is. Let's see what this is. Let's say like Better not be something that gets us banned from YouTube. <laughs> yeah, right? Slow. Blue server server, doesn't it? Is it a different one? It might, you, you might try to turn off the proxy because it might be, if it's using some, like webcams might use a weird protocol that my server doesn't support. If it's out of speed. Yeah, well, if it, if it loads or if it doesn't, you know, that's... Waiting for you. We got a title, we got a page title. Well, also... This is... I'll have to turn this back on. If you want to play around with it, this is a really awesome resource. Exploit database is just full of juicy exploits and stuff to play around with on VMs. And here we go. It's just a bunch of different dorks that people have uploaded. And you can even select categories. You can look for error messages from websites. And those will give you like possible ideas to maybe it has like certain exploits uh, they can be used on it. So, very cool stuff. Very cool stuff Google dorking is. Now I'm going to show you guys who is information, and this is also a huge part of analyzing. Oh, okay, it looks like a, like a yeah, construction site. Weird. Uh, where's my... Oh, no. There it is. Okay. Um, so, yeah, who is information? Who has like knows what who is information is or you used it before no no only two people all right so who is information is extremely extremely useful uh it is what uh, i'll use at my job if i'm you know analyzing and i'm going down i found a domain if i want to learn more about the domain i want to know who registered that domain like kroger.com i want to know when they registered it has it expired recently when did they renew it what are the IPs that have been associated with that domain? What are the phone numbers of the people who registered it? What are the emails of the people who registered it? Uh, who is hosting the domain? Who are they paying to host the domain? And this is all in the public domain. It's all free. And a really great website to go to is uh, who is uh, domain tools. So I'm sure this will just, yeah, who is domain tools.com. Uh, so we can type in any website here. Let's do Kroger.com. Why not? Because Kroger's a theme today. Um, and here we go. We're given uh, the registrar. So it looks like they're using Network Solutions LLC to host. Don't use Network Solutions. They're evil. Yeah. Um, we got these different name servers. We have the contact. If we wanted to contact them about their servers, say if their servers all of a sudden started sending out a bunch of malware, um, we have an IP and it says 28 other sites are hosted on the server. So other domains for that IP, uh, we can see, you know, the history, 72 changes on 33 unique IP addresses over 14 years. So, you know, this is a great example of, uh, why if I'm, you know, doing some triaging and I'm looking at trying to trace down, you know, where's this attack coming from? I, I if I see an IP, I'm like, oh, well, it could, it could be anything. It changes all the time. Um, yeah, you, you can wear. Oh yeah, web server type. That's cool. also interesting. Is uh, for IP location up there, they show uh, Akamai, which is a, a popular CDN. So that's good to know. And then you know we're going to go ahead and we're going to get more into the Who Is record. Oh geez, that's not a storefront. You're training Google. That's true. Oh my gosh. Oh wait. What? Okay. Um, so yeah, he, here is like what the domain uh, tools is really giving you, or the who is information is really giving you. Uh, it's just this big text doc. You know, you're gonna see that it covers a lot of the same stuff that was up there. Um, you know, more on the registrants. Um, shout out to Richard. Administration domain. Yeah. Shout out Richard Hawk. Shout out domain admin at Kroger.com. Um, the last of these guys emails all over the 
Yeah, so this is essentially domain tools. So with Google Dorks, you can use to kind of track down and understand more about, you know, a website or a series of websites or a company. And then with who is information domain tools, you can get more context as to what you're looking at. And the biggest thing in cybersecurity, especially if you guys want to do analyst work in the future, is it's all about context. You know, you can have all the indicators in the world. You can have all the evidence in the world that something bad happens, but in what context does it happen? Because that's how you can catch it in the future and start attributing what's happening. Um, so that's, that's that. And, you know, got some good, yep. I just wanted to remind everyone domain tools is what those guys at Prep Security use when they're trying to figure out uh, where that, that attacker was coming from when he stole their domain names. That was something they were using for reconnaissance. It's a super popular tool. I mean, it's it is a staple tool for any cyber analyst. I use it all the time, all the time, day in day out. It's one of my favorite websites. That and Virus Total. Uh, I'll go ahead and pull up Virus Total here. I know I've shown you guys some of you guys Virus Total before, um, but Virus Total. I think it's run by Google. Um, you can go ahead and like uh, search. A URL. Uh, we'll just do Kroger.com again. We'll see what happens. Uh, and it will give you a little bit on what antiviruses have found anything bad from that website or what has been reported as bad. And a little bit into the details. Uh, not nearly as, and you know, community too, but not nearly as in depth as domain tools because this isn't who is information. This is more about detection information. Uh, regardless, um, it's interesting. Um, they also have a graphing function, which also allows you to get a little bit more context. Can I shout out one more website for looking at the main stuff? Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's uh, called CRT.sh. And uh, basically, uh, if you want a secure website, meaning like a website with an HTTP certificate, um, you have to register that with a registrar. And nowadays, most registrars have like what's called uh, certificate transparency, where all their like issued certificates are public. and like every major one has it, and increasingly even the minor ones are getting it. So if you want to find the history of something like, um, uh, like say, if you want to find every domain name that begins with Kroger, that has like, in general, more and more websites are using HTTPS. So you're finding that more and more, you'll be able to use this to find domain. So here's every domain that's had a certificate issued that starts with Kroger, so you can see Wow, there's like certificates every day, but you can see there are just any domain you want to find for this. Um, to give an example of this being useful, um, let's see, let me go back. Uh, there was a Cards Against Humanity, you guys might know. They were running a promotion where they, every, like they ran a promotion for like a week and every day they had a new thing with a new domain name. And I got really curious what the rest of the week was going to be when they started it. And it was always like Cards Against Humanity saves baseball, Cards Against Humanity uh, saves uh saves the world or whatever so i did this and i was able to find the other domains that they had for um their project like destroys homework saves baseball redistributes your wealth so i i got to i got to uh get a sneak peek a couple days ahead on that with that so that's another really cool website yeah i haven't actually used that one before um so yeah uh there's some really great other videos that you can watch defcon always has great vids uh do you have something to say, Chris? Yeah, I know where your cat lives. It's just a website. I know where your cat lives. Is a is this? Can I just Google it and pull it up? Yeah. Let's see. I want to see this. This is interesting. We'll, we'll move it over here. Um. Yeah. So those other two talks up there, your leaking trade secrets, is a really great one. I've watched that one. That's really cool. He talks about what we talked about today in terms of like using LinkedIn to draw a picture. Uh, and he, he does a really good job explaining why it's important. I mean, a lot of the things, the only way you can really prevent, this is interesting, the only way you can really, um, wow, it's like Japan, it's some cats, man. Um, so like the only way that you can really prevent these kind of uh, reconnaissance attacks against you is by minimizing your digital footprint so um, a lot of people in the field of cybersecurity don't have a Facebook or don't like using a whole lot of social media because at the end of the day, if you can draw a picture 
of, you know, who are you friends with? Who are your friends of friends with? And who do they, where do they work? And what are they interested in? You can start learning a lot about a person. Um, and it is, it's kind of scary. Uh, what the heck? This could be so easily repurposed for other stuff. Oh, yeah. That's the point. What's that thing? Actually, that would be really cool to, uh, tool to make sense now. Don't you think? We need to have a phone problem. So, well, imagine if, if all you did was extract metadata. And with that, just whatever you search, I think all the images. Mm -hmm. So, with that, I think we're done. Uh, I know this wasn't the most technical. Uh, of weeks uh, of meetings, but we, we definitely delve into the, the technical side. We, our past couple of meetings have been very technical, so I, I highly recommend that you uh, check us out again uh, and see what else we do, because it's not always this kind of stuff. If, anyway, if yep. you want to hang around, there's a couple more sites I can shout out. I, I did, like, I worked at a data company for like three years, so I, 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 I became slowly the master of this. So, uh, and good luck with midterms, everybody. <laughs> so um, if you want to find property records, you generally want to look for, you want to figure out what county they're based in, and you want to look for the tax assessor. So let's say I wanted to look up someone in the state, if I wanted to find a building that's in uh, Hamilton County, where we live, then, oh wow, this took me right to the search page, but the tax assessor, also known as the auditor, is the one who will have this. If you literally typed in a person, I'm not going to type in a real person's name on this site because it will literally pull up their address and a picture of their house and stuff. I'm not going to put that put that out, but if I put in, I guess, Kroger. Oh, God, no, real people. Go away. <laughs> See, like, this is, like, like, really, like, it really gets in depth. And you can do this for pretty much any county in the country. Um, another thing... In most states, voter data is hard to get a hold on, but Ohio is actually one of the exceptions. So if you search Ohio voter file, you can literally go to the Secretary of State's website and download every single records on every single person who was registered to vote um, as like a big CSV. So that's really useful for uh, trying to figure out, like if you need to figure out someone's birthday or something, that's all in there. You, want, you can even figure out what party they're registered as, which seems kind of wrong, but <laughs> um, what else is there? Um, those are two big ones. What, what else were we talking about? Building permits, those you can generally find. If you search like city name, those are handled by the city rather than the state. So I happen to know uh, Cincinnati, Ohio has an open data website. Um, and if I search for... Permits. You can just search name of city open data and see if they have it. Here's building permits. And so what was what was this address for them? Uh, 1014. Huh? That's the owner address. Uh, well, whatever. It's a address. It's also the mailing address. The owner address. So here's every permit issued in uh, Cincinnati since 2010. Um, and if I go if I go here and I say 1014 Vine. Could probably find any permits that have been issued to that building. There are usually permits for a building that big. I will be very shocked if there are none. Yeah, so you can see there's a lot of permits. Commercial buildings tend to have that. You can see, like, in, on January 25th, 2013, they did a repair, and you can probably even, um, there should be a link. Yeah, here we go. There's a link, and you can go to this link. And Oh, my God, let me copy the link. Is it seriously not going to let me copy this link? Okay. Well, you could go to that link and um, find out even more, like exactly what was done. B building permits go down really low level. And you can find this for most major cities nowadays and more and more. Wow. Yeah. That could, that could be a cool way to find the means of carrying out that. It's crazy. Yes, what do you think yeah, about it's... the building permit you were pressing today? Yeah. No, yeah, it's up there like in 48 hours in most places. It's up there pretty quick. Yeah, it's Ohio, Oklahoma, and like maybe one other state where you, anyone can get the voter records without having to prove anything. Otherwise, they tend to be a lot harder. But uh, some states you have to pay. There's actually oh, this is this is there's this guy out there who I don't know. He's just, I I think this might be him, but he's he's like obsessed with making data open or something. So he he buys in states that let anyone have it, but but pay a big fee. Uh, for the voter file, he buys it like every month and publishes it online. So you can find this guy's website, FL Voters. He's got a couple other sites. What are they like? Delaware Voters. He actually 
Utah used to have it so you could buy their data, and because of this guy, Utah, the, the state legislator, passed a law uh, that they would no longer have it. Like here, I find Utah voters from this guy. Uh, let's see. Here we go, Utah. Yeah, look, he's got a lot of states online, so this guy is really useful. <laughs> yeah, you can read here this whole thing where where Utah took off, took off, like made it so you couldn't buy their voter file anymore because of this guy. But plenty of other states, you can still get it. <laughs> so, so I guess the one takeaway is how much information you can really get online without doing any direct scanning, just from searching and using what's given to you. It's pretty, pretty insane. It's pretty insane. All right, we about, wrap, we about ready to wrap it up? Yeah, 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 I was just sort of, was I awesome. figured I'd do this as people left. <laughs> that was good. Yeah, so thanks for coming, guys. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, if you want to hang out at the hackathon, feel free. Come on to uh, Rhodes' 10th floor and, uh, you know, say hi. You, you got to go to the, the staircase in the far the corner of the building and then you go up. You go to the ninth floor engineering and then you go up the stairs. What you have to do is you have to uh, yeah, write by snail mail, you have to write a letter. Yeah. Wait, well, no, but uh, you're from the ninth floor. Your social security yeah, address. Yeah, I need your data yeah. server. I thought it was on the eighth floor. What's the YouTube? Or cyber, cyber, at YouTube. Cyber, 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 you see, yeah. Uh, uh, at, actually, it's the word at, not symbol at the eighth floor. No, it's oh, just the, the, the uh, our YouTube channel. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. We're going to be in the 10th oh, floor going to have to I just need all the separate yeah. uses. Oh, uh, you, you got our YouTube channel. Is is like having that. That. No, it doesn't. But so the food is going to be on the 8th floor. Yeah, we'll go down and get food. Right here. I'm pretty uh, sure it doesn't. Well, um, Oh, it does. But you can search with the app, so it's all our screen kind of name with the app. Uh, 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 I wish I had paid attention and realized what the meat was this week. I, I can do so much on this stuff. <laughs>